Good morning everyone and welcome to our EU DataVis webinar. My name is Simon Steuer, I'm from the Publications Office of the European Union and I'm here together with Beatrice and Inma and we are very happy to have Jovan Lekovic here with us to do this presentation. A few basics as always in advance. Um, this is part of the community of practice for data visualization. Inma already shared the link in the chat box. So please feel free to join. There are already over 500 members. All webinars will be recorded and you can watch them later also today on YouTube. Please mute yourself, uh, deactivate your camera so that we have a good connection. And one additional remark, this will be the last webinar with this WebEx link. Next time we have to use a new license, but uh, of course we will keep you posted for this. And now, with no further ado, I would like to give the floor to Jovan. The stage is yours. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Simon. And hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's a huge pleasure to be able to talk about uh, the topic that I'm going to be covering today. Um, and this is kind of the second time I'm talking about this for EU Database. Last time, we were lucky to be able to meet in person uh, in Luxembourg and talk about these things. But here I've tried to pick out a few more topics um, and a few more ideas for some of those for, of you who've seen this. Uh, hopefully it brings in a few new elements. Um, I'm Jovan. I'm a freelancing data visualization consultant, data wrangler. Uh, I work with codes. Um, I look at automating processes with data. Um, and I do a bit of teaching. So at the moment, for example, I'm working with a wonderful client in the diversity and inclusion sector, helping the creative industry understand um, diversity in the workplace. But I also, for example, do a bit of teaching with uh, the London College of Communication, where I work with um, design students uh, and help them get up to speed with with um, their analytical skills. So I'm a bit of an all-rounder, I'm not a designer, and I'm not a data scientist, but I kind of both use design and data science in my practice, in my day-to-day -day work. What I'm really passionate about is data visualization. Uh, and in a past life, I've worked with BBC, for example, um, as, as the lead on data visualization for the BBC's audiences team. So that, for example, meant developing a style guide for Tableau dashboards. I've also worked with clients to develop dashboards that help interact with kind of uh, their analytics in a meaningful way. But really what a lot of my job is, is basically moving data around. And a lot of that is moving data around from, let's say, uh, databases into smaller data sets or data summaries and then into visualizations. But the key thing uh, for me is really moving it, data into people's minds. And to contextualize this, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I see the role of data visualization. And for those of you who are only just having your morning coffee, uh, we're going to start with, with a really big topic. So, so apologies for that. But I'm going to start with this idea of there is a reality out there that uh, is huge and complex, uh, and I'm spelling it with a capital R. This is things happening in the outside world. It's so big that it doesn't fit on my slide here. Uh, but because we're human, we're interested in reality. And what we want to understand is, um, the way we understand reality is by producing facts. Uh, and that's a way of, of summarizing reality in, in interesting ways. And we collect all of these facts and we might have different types of attributes. So the color of, of, of the sky is blue or um, Jovan is happy about his job or, or other elements that we observe in reality. And we collect these facts. We summarize them into what we call data because of Latin, uh, in, in, in other ways, in other words, a collection of facts. And really the purpose of collecting these facts and, and collecting data is communicating it back to an audience. And this audience um, in many can be a mix of different people. But the idea is that to communicate data, we somehow have to present it to the audience. And I use the word presentation here 
in the sense that um, not all data visualization is a visual process. It can be uh, a few different things. But really, the aim is to, to package up data in a way that is communicable to an audience. Now, the reason I'm kind of going into this is that there are several layers of abstraction that we do in this process. So we start from reality, um, and facts are a shadow of this reality. Um, they, they, they're not capitalized for a reason here. They're small reflections of, of, of what we can observe. Um, data is a summary of those facts, and then the data presentation is an abstraction of, of that summary. So, so we do have this process which gets away from, from what we want to talk about, and it becomes more and more abstract. And really within that data presentation element is, is what I want to think about in terms of data visualization aesthetics. Now, a way that helps me frame what I'm talking about here is that we are talking about shadows of communicable reality at scale. So the idea that shadows as in an abstraction of reality uh, that we want to communicate and it's scaled in terms of it being data. So let's try to see how this fits with data visualization aesthetics specifically. Now, to do that, I'm going to go back to um, a course I teach about data visualization design. Um, and one of the exercises I do with my students is I ask them to make really horrible graphs. The idea being that I want them to produce these graphs and then explain why they are horrible. So what design elements have they used to make these charts really horrible? And here's an example from, from one of the students, uh, which uses a lot of this green and red pie chart, very hard to distinguish what is going on, mix of fonts. Uh, you can see a few other horrors. Um, so so uh, one team who decided to do these different labels with a mix of uh, 3D charts um, and then line charts in the background, very confusing. Another team had a particular hatred around transitions in PowerPoint. So they added this whoosh sign to make sure that that is, um, that is also clear in, in terms of why this graph is horrible. Um, it might involve adding really unnecessary silly backgrounds like floating fish, um, or this one, which is one of my personal favorites, which not only displays data in multiple dimensions in a way, but also has a very random um, image of a pizza in the corner. Now, this has made me interested in the topic of, well, we have really good instincts about what makes a chart horrible or what makes it bad visually. But the question is, what makes a chart good looking? And how can we use that in data visualization? But to get to the essence of this, I'm going to ask first whether, whether aesthetics matter. And you won't be surprised um, to hear me say that I think they do. And there are three reasons I think they do. One is the aesthetic usability effect. Second part is that aesthetics communicate. And third part is that they are a way of signifying importance. If we start with the first idea, is the, it's, it's based, based on research from the 90s that looked at uh, aesthetics in design specifically. And the idea is that designs that are more aesthetically pleasing are also perceived to be more functional. So aesthetics are not just uh, an element of, of how, um, how things look, but how we perceive their functionality. And to illustrate this, effect. Um, let's take two product designs for a phone. Uh, one of these you've probably seen in your office. The top one is something that I've probably had way too many meetings surrounded around one of these phones where, where um, it has uh, button, uh, buttons that you can use to quickly dial somebody. It probably remembers a few stored phone numbers. You can put it on a loudspeaker, whereas the phone at the bottom is aesthetically pleasing but it's not very functional uh, per se. So if we look at this for in the sense of the aesthetic usability effect, the, let's say, modern phone has high usability, 
uh, the, the older phone, probably less so, you would have to use the, the circular dial to, to phone somebody, which takes time. But because I really like this small green phone that, that, is, um, that is, to me, aesthetically pleasing, it actually makes me want to call somebody from that phone, whereas the other one, I think of meetings, I don't, you know, it has an aesthetic connotation for me. So the aesthetic uh, usability effect basically says that things that look good to us are things that we want to use um, or we perceive uh, as being more usable. The other thing that I want to talk about here is the idea of aesthetics communicating. And I think of this as a bit of a soft skill in communicating data. The idea that the aesthetic choices that you make also have a role in communicating something about the data. Now, to understand that, I'm looking at a chart which has the same data, but the only difference between these two charts is the thickness of the line. And already you can notice that there's something different about these two concepts. The thinner line feels more marginal as opposed to the thicker line, which feels more important. The one on the left feels more precise. It's actually covering less surface area on the chart. So, so it, it implies that we're talking about a very, very specific point, whereas the thicker line covers more space, which means it could be a bit more vague. The one on the left is what we think of as technical, so something you would do in a technical drawing, whereas the one on the right is a bit more sketchy, like uh, something a, a kid with a crayon might draw. And then finally, the voice of these two uh, charts is that the one on the left with the thinner line feels a bit more shy, whereas the one on the right is a bit more confident, even a bit brash. So I think this is quite important in terms of all of our aesthetic choices, because whatever we do, as soon as we move from the defaults that we get in our software, we're actually saying something um, about the data and we're somehow designing, and that is important. Now, the third uh, element that I want to talk about here is something that is a bit of a personal extrapolation into the future. Um, and I think this is already happening. But the idea that aesthetics is a way of signaling importance. Uh, I'm going to look at this fantastic quote from uh, Amanda Cox, who is the editor of The Upshot for The New York Times. And she talks about the difference between publishing a data visualization in print and um, publishing data visualization online. So I'll go through the quote. In print, the New York Times can use scarcity to indicate importance by giving an important graphic a desirable spot on a good page. On the web, the equivalent scarce resource isn't placement, but the allocation of valuable internal tech or development hours. So the idea here is that basically the way a chart is produced, so the technical skill involved in producing a chart for the internet is a thing that makes it important to readers, whereas in print, it would be the space of the page. We're getting much better at the technology, so the technical part is becoming easier, we have much better tools, we have a lot more to do with those tools. So I personally think that visualization is going to be the next way of signaling importance. And if we look at design, uh, in this case, car design, uh, you know, I think there was a potentially a phase in car design where all cars look the same. And this basically means that from, you kind of just look at functionality to, to distinguish between your car purchasing choices, for example. But then comes along uh, something that is quite interesting from a, from a design aesthetics point of view, uh, which is Nissan Figaro, which has no functional improvement in terms of what it can do as a car. But all about this car's design is focused on the aesthetics rather than the functionality. And suddenly, the aesthetics are what make this car important. In other words, what makes people notice. And I think something similar applies to data visualization and um, giving things emphasis. That's all fine and well. 
But what could we say makes data visualization aesthetically pleasing? Well, um, to understand this, I've looked at a paper by Paul Heckert, who talks about design aesthetics specifically and looking at the principles around design aesthetics in design. Now, I have to apologize to Professor Heckert because I certainly got carried away with this. It's very much me trying to apply this, these concepts, which I think are phenomenal, to data visualization and trying to see how they fit, which means I've definitely extrapolated a little bit from the paper and shortened some of the terminology because some of the terminology is quite long and it wouldn't fit on my slides. But the idea is that this is very much at the heart of what I'm talking about. I certainly recommend reading the paper because I think it's, it's a great piece of um, work looking at design aesthetics. Now, what Heckert talks about are four principles. I've termed them aptness, efficiency, clarity, and something called Maya. And what these four principles address is aesthetics from a sensory and an intellectual point of view. We can derive aesthetic pleasure from a sensory experience. So for example, tasty food, beautiful music, looking at a pretty landscape, but we can also derive aesthetic pleasure from an intellectual point of view. So reading a lovely story, uh, watching a beautiful goal in football, for example, or talking about an elegant idea or a solution to a problem that, that is, is quite beautiful. In it. So the question is, how do we connect this to database? I think these are really related. Um, to understand this, I'm going to go through each one of them and see how they connect to design and how they look at database, and we're going to look at some examples. So the concept of aptness is very much about this idea of form following function. And to help explain this, let's say you have a brief which involves communicating a message. Uh, and the brief says you, the message that you're communicating needs to say stop and you need a design that also helps you say stop at the same time, which is easy. We've seen this design thousands of times. The design that we're looking at says stop with its sharp angular curves, with the red strong background, uh, with, with the strong typography. Um, and the message says stop as well. Uh, quite literally, it is the word stop. But what happens if we start reducing or removing some of the design elements, making things a bit curvier, changing the, the background color into something that is a bit more ambiguous in terms of its meaning or moving the font into a comic sans? Well, suddenly we've changed the relationship between the message and what's, what the design is saying. Uh, we've gone from having one supporting the other towards one potentially conflicting, uh, being in conflict with you. So to understand a lot of this, we have to think about aptness as this idea that is very, very contextual, understanding a number of things to, to position um, appropriateness in context. Uh, if you are as old as I am, you might remember this meme from what seems to be ages ago, uh, which basically looks at somebody using Comic Sans in an office uh, and somebody responding to that, please don't use Comic Sans. We are a Fortune 500 company, not a lemonade stand. But this gets to this point of context to me, which is using Comic Sans in this environment is not appropriate. But let's say you do have a lemonade stand and you're recording your sales. Uh, well, unless you were going to investors or were publishing a scientific journal about lemon, your lemonade sales, you wouldn't be using a chart like this because the design is a uh, very, very different language than what you would use to do something that is probably quite natural, you would be doing on your own. So in this case, comic science might be quite appropriate. Now, this relates to a lot of different concepts in data visualization. For example, uh, we can relate this back to the choice of chart type that you use. And this is a visualization from the New York Times, 
which looks at basically the, the proportion of hits by angle in baseball. I know nothing about sports, so it's very possible that I'll say wrong things here. But the idea is that this could have been a bar graph just showing a distribution. But the way it's the chart choice is basically trying to emphasize what it's talking about in the data. So it's, it's very appropriate in terms of um, the chart type. We can also think even further up the, the scale of decision making in, in design, which is what is the medium being chosen to display the visualization? And this is a piece of work from uh, Nadim Haidari, and it talks about the um, average food intake by different region. But the way this is visualized is the size of each plate corresponds to, to those averages. So you can see the, the, the plate for Africa is a bit smaller than for the rest of the world. Uh, and the choice of medium here, so using plates as a form of visualization, is appropriate. And we get a certain sense of aesthetic pleasure from that connection. So this is very much about design, making design that fits the data, finding the right tone that talks to your audience, finding a medium that matches the message that you want to convey. Um, and I really, really love uh, a lot of the work that Mona Chalabi does, for example, uh, and a lot of it uses this technique to, in many ways, subvert chart conventions because a lot of the work that Mona Chalabi does is about subverting power. So this is a visualization that looks at the amount of money a black person in the United States earns compared to what a white person in the United States might earn. Um, and the way it's displayed is it's hand-drawn, it uses an element of collage in the visualization, but the really interesting and important thing for me here is not that the, those specific te techniques per se, but the collection of those techniques, which is going away from traditional charts, which are a traditional way of, of communicating power and are associated with communicating power. This, is, this visualization is not made for people in power. This visualization is made for people who, who don't normally see conventional chart types, and the design is emphasizing that. Now, to talk about a lot of these concepts, I'm going to use a beautiful visualization from, from Simon Scar. Um, this is a visualization called Iraq's Bloody Toe, and it shows month by month the number of deaths during the Iraq war. Uh, it was published in the South China Morning Post. -Ed. Now, what I love about this is, okay, of course it's unconventional, but in many ways, actually what it's doing is extremely conventional because when we're talking about violent death, that is not a positive thing. And here the actual data is being shown below the axis in a negative way. Um, and that is very appropriate for the data that we're talking about and in many ways very respectful to the data that we're talking about. So we derive aesthetic pleasure from connecting these ideas, which I think is really powerful. We'll talk about this visualization later on because I think there are, it touches on all of the elements that I talked about. Basically, the idea of aptness is there to resolve the tension between what is being said and how it's being said. Right. Moving on to the next concept, which is efficiency. So you might know this as less is more. And we have seen this idea in design for um, as part of modernity in many ways. So this is anything from product design in uh, Dieter Rams, who's a, who's a master of, of this approach, um, to Ludwig Mies uh, van der Rohe, who, who coined the term uh, less is more. We've seen it in architecture and you might recognize this object um, as, as an example of technology design. But really what a lot of this approach does is reducing objects to their essence. Luckily, for data visualization, we already have a very good foundation for a philosophy that works around this. Uh, if you're not familiar with Edward Tufte, I, I highly recommend reading uh, all he writes on data visualization. 
but his approach is very much about reducing visualizations to their essence. In other words, above all else, showing the data. How this works in practice? Well, let's start with the charts that Edward Tufte would probably freak out about. Um, and let's start applying some of the principles that he talks about to see what we can get to. And the idea is that from Tufte's point of view, removing anything that is not really data in the chart, and that can uh, mean removing um, axes, supporting scaffolding around the chart, elements that are unnecessary, and even reducing some of the elements. And this is much more efficient in terms of communicating. We don't have to work hard to see where the data is on this chart. But the great thing about this is also that this is more aesthetically pleasing. And this is something that both Edward Tufte and Heckert agree on in many ways. Um, the idea that we actually also have a more aesthetically pleasing experience from a more efficient approach to showing the data. Another thing that Hecker talks about in his paper is the idea of metaphors. Uh, and this helps us connect big ideas in a really, really efficient way. And a beautiful example of that in terms of visualization and, and a stunning piece of visualization is from, I believe, a couple of years ago now. Um, this looks at immigration uh, to the United States. Uh, each ring represents, uh, I believe, a decade. And each dot within those rings represents 100 people. And in a way, this kind of shows how immigration has changed over time of people coming into the US. But obviously, the thing that it does so, so well here is connects it to this bigger idea about how culture is formed and how society is formed. Um, and it connects it to this wonderful idea of these are rings of a tree and you can see the history by, by kind of looking under these layers. And if we go back to Simon Scar's visualization, uh, obviously the, 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 the metaphor here is an association with death. Um, there's a very, very strong connotation of blood being displayed in this visualization. Uh, and, and I think that's what makes it really powerful. But don't forget something really basic as well here. And we go back to the principles that Tufte talks about and the idea of less is more. There is not much on this huge visualization that isn't actually showing the data. Most of what you're seeing here is the data being displayed. The next concept I'm going to talk about is the idea of clarity. And this is very much the idea of creating order in chaos. Um, going back to Heckert's paper, the world out there is loaded with information. It is therefore beneficial to perceive connections and make relationships, to see what belongs together and what not. In sum, in order to perform these tasks, our sensory systems must detect order in chaos or unity in variety. And Heckert argues that this is something that we actually get aesthetic pleasure from. Now, the way we talk about this in design is something called Gestalt or Gestalt principles. And this helps us explain how our brains organize and interpret patterns. So you have the similarity principle, and there's a lot more of these principles, but I'll only mention two now. Um, and that says that things that look similar uh, belong together. So the way we're perceiving this current object is that the darker dots belong in a group because they have similar traits. Or proximity, things that are closer together look like they belong together. Um, that's how our mind perceives these um, through uh, Gestalt principles. These principles are so ingrained in how design works that it's very hard to imagine designs that don't use them. So here we've got the principle of similarity in terms of the color of the, the, the buttons on a remote and the shape of the buttons on the remote. But we've also got proximity in terms of how the buttons are organized. Uh, if we did this, suddenly a lot of that organization disappears. And we've just removed one of the principles, remember, because we've still got color encoding. Uh, so you would still be able to, to say, this is the button that switches the TV off, which is different from the other buttons. 
And this kind of concept, if um, you like memes, is this particular meme format riffs on that concept. And normally it talks precisely about the, the, the problem of gestalt um, proximity. So how text is organized in, a, in an image. Well, let's see how that works for visualization. So let's take a very default Excel chart. So this is something you would get by default in Excel. But in reality, what I'm interested in here is showing trends for this made up data. And the way I'm going to approach that is by using the proximity principle. So instead of organizing uh, proximity around years, I'm organizing proximity around different countries. So we can see the trend for each country much more clearly here. Now we can use Gestalt even further. I, for example, am making an assumption that my readers are most interested in the most recent year and how that compares to 10 years ago. And if I were to use the similarity or difference principle in Gestalt, I can use that to, to really help uh, create a bit of this order out of the chaos of all of this data. Now, the key thing here is that also we perceive this as being more aesthetically pleasing because we know what we're looking at. We, we are not confused. So Gestalt helps us organize information so that it becomes meaningful to our audience. And that has an aesthetic effect. A fantastic visualization or piece that uses this technique is by Lisa Charlotte Rost, who's a fantastic theoretician uh, of data visualization, but also practitioner. Uh, and here she looks at six years of her Google searches for different cities she's lived in. Now, the, re the thing that you probably see straight away is this white line that kind of curves along the graph. And this shows you what you should be looking at in the visualization. And it uses two different Gestalt principles. One is called enclosure, the other is called continuity. But in terms of an organizing method, it really helps you as an audience know what to look at, and we get pleasure from that. And if we go back to the visualization by Simon Scar, this uses, uh, for example, Gestalt uh, proximity and similarity. So we look at the distinction between the, the top here, which is darker red, and that shows um, the number of coalition deaths versus the number of civilian deaths, which is in the lighter red. So you get this distinction uh, by using the, the similarity principle, but also the labels are very close to the data. So this uses the proximity principle to say, this relates to this bit of information, which really helps the reader uh, navigate through this. The final concept I want to talk about is something called most advanced yet acceptable. And this is something I'm very excited about because um, I don't think we really talk about this very much in terms of data visualization best practice. Now, this term was coined by Raymond Lowy, uh, a hugely influential American designer. Uh, and basically it's the idea that we like things which are on the one hand typical of an object and on the other hand are slightly innovative. So it's a balance between things that are new but familiar. Um, and what you're seeing here is Raymond, Slowy, uh, Raymond Lowy's visual explanation of that concept where he looks at, for example, the evolution of the designs for the telephone or for a clock. And the idea that he kind of conveys here is very much the idea that each successive design is, is looking at the previous design in terms of, of how it works, but it's also bringing in new elements. And that balance between the two is what creates aesthetic pleasure. Uh, as an aside, Raymond Lowy actually touches on the concept of data visualization and aesthetics in one of his quotes. Uh, and I believe the quote was something along the lines of the most beautiful curve in design is the curve of a sales graph going up. So a very commercially minded fellow. But I think this principle is really, really useful. And it talks about we have an aesthetic preference for design that embodies concepts of typicality. So, so the 
nature of an object and novelty, so changes to that object. Uh, but those mixed together. And that's, that sweet spot is where we get aesthetic pleasure from. And this makes sense from an evolutionary point of view because we have evolved through a mix of thinking about safety, but also thinking about risk, uh, because those two things have helped us both uh, survive, but also progress from, from another point of view. So we do find pleasure in things that mix the two. And if we're um, thinking about how this works in terms of product design, well, you know, if you look back at cameras from the 1960s and cameras being produced now, they are going back to this kind of typical object of what a camera looks like. And the fun thing is that if you look at how these two cameras work underneath, it's entirely different. In fact, the camera in 2018 could have any shape because it doesn't really matter. The technology that's inside it captures images uh, through a very different method from, from analog cameras, which needed the space in this design to fit film. So in many ways, the, the design aesthetics within this are, are around um, going back to typicality. And there's a phenomenal example in data visualization that I really, really like, and I think embodies this quite well. You might find this image familiar. Um, but when this was originally published, it was quite advanced in terms of uh, how it communicated data. And this is by um, Harold Kraft, who published it while well, looking at pulse profiles and dispersion measures of pulsars. Uh, and quite frankly, I, I don't know anything about the science behind this, but I do know the graph. And the reason I do is because it's very much part of popular culture. So this was used as um, the design for the Unknown Pleasures album by Joy Division. And that made it acceptable, which produced an interesting effect, which is that now in data visualization, or at least a few years ago, uh, this became extremely, extremely popular. Uh, these are known as ridge plots. And this is a fantastic example from James Cheshire, who uses it as a way um, of displaying the, the population distribution around the earth, uh, around uh, different longitudes. And it's, it's basically playing on this concept of you're familiar with this design, uh, but we're going to change it, uh, switch around the data and show you something different. And we get aesthetic pleasure from that. And another example that I want to talk about, uh, and if you're, um, if you've researched a bit of data visualization, I'm sure you've come across this, but it's the classic uh, Florence Nightingale rose diagram. If you're not familiar with this, these two visualizations basically look at the number of deaths during the Crimean War, um, by, and they're categorized by deaths that could have been prevented, and that's the big blue areas, versus deaths in the battlefield or deaths from other causes. Now, to understand this, Florence Nightingale was trying to use this as a form of persuasion to persuade policymakers to invest more in sanitary conditions. And if you're thinking, OK, this is the 1800s uh, and they were so backwards and they didn't understand the importance of sanitary conditions in hospital, all you need to think is perhaps a year back where we were having all of these same complicated discussions around whether to use face masks, what kind of distance we need to have from other people uh, during the COVID crisis. Florence Nightingale used this as a way of persuading policymakers that sanitary conditions were important. And it was not an easy job. But I think part of the choices that um, she made in terms of presenting this chart in this way were around the aesthetic qualities. So producing something that is slightly different from what could have been a bar chart. Now, speaking of bar charts, we can go back to Simon Scar's Iraq Bloody Toll. And what is, again, great about this uh, visualization aesthetically is that this is basically a bar chart. It is extremely familiar. It's extremely acceptable. We know how to read this. Um, but at the same time, it introduces a few modifications, such as changing the how we normally read the axis. It's changing, you can see the slight tweaks, the curvature at the end of the graphs, which kind of goes back to that concept of blood. So it kind of plays around with this idea of 
this is a conventional graph, but what can we change within it to, to create a slightly different aesthetic effect? So this is all fine and well. These are the four kind of concepts that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the question remains, how would you use this in practice? Well, first of all, I don't think these are um, rules. I don't think these are fa you know, fast and hard rules. Personally, after researching this and doing, doing this talk a few times, I, I really think of this as guiding principles. And it is not to say that one is more important than the other or that, that you should always do one in a certain way. It's more of a thing that I personally use to go through each step in my process and just think about what I'm doing there uh, to create an aesthetic effect. And this is kind of how I use them right now. I actually go in this same sequence of aptness, efficiency, clarity, and most advanced yet acceptable. And I think aptness is what, what normally, the, the, when you get started with data visualization, this is what you think about a lot. But the people who call themselves designers, which I, I don't, probably spend a lot of think, time thinking about most advanced yet acceptable. So in terms of aptness, I think about where I'll be publishing the visualization, um, whether that's going to be something that goes online, uh, how does that mean I need to work around the aesthetic qualities, uh, or can I use a different medium? I think about who it's for, how comfortable are the people who are going to be reading the visualization with data, how does the language need to be complex or simple, and I think a lot about the context. So how can I use uh, the right chart with this particular type of data? If you've seen the FT's visual vocabulary, that's a fantastic resource to have a structured way of thinking about that. Next, I tend to think about efficiency. So is the data at the forefront of what I'm displaying? So making sure that I'm using a maximum, maximum reasonable data ink ratio. So data ink ratio is another concept from, well, the same concept from Edward Tufte. Uh, I recommend you look it up if you're not familiar with it. Um, but then I'm also thinking about what can I remove? What is unnecessary? Um, and how do I make sure that, that those things that are unnecessary are faded into the, the background? And then I also potentially think about whether there are any metaphors that, are, that can really be a hook for the reader. So connecting these big ideas in a way that, that makes it easier for them. Um, I look at clarity from the point of view of organizing my visualization. So this is very much about understanding what are the relationships I want to emphasize and show. Um, and you can do that through the use of color or shapes or sizes. So visual attributes that you've got at your disposal when you're going through the design process. This is also where I think a lot about hierarchy. So how is somebody going to read through a visualization and how do I help them do that? And if you remember that fantastic example from, uh, from Lisa Charlotte Ross, that's definitely a technique that I want to try out on, on some of my own visualizations. And when I've done all of that, I, I, I go back to this question of, well, is this something that is going to be familiar to my audience? Are they going to be able to, to understand it? And then from the other side is, what can I change while still kind of keeping the meaning? What can I twist around? Are there any other angles that I can get into data? And then finally, of course, the question of, have I overdone it? Uh, and this is possibly the, the, the more difficult one uh, where you kind of go back back and forth with yourself trying to understand uh, which elements might have gone a bit too far or not and then reining those back in. But a lot of this final step is really about the design tweaks um, rather than, than potentially uh, hierarchy, which, which I deal with in, in terms of clarity. So that kind of hopefully gives you a bit of an idea of both how these ideas work and how to use them in your day-to-day -day process. Um, I hope this has been useful. I find this structure very, very useful for, for the work that I do. Uh, and I hope it's something that you can also take away and, and use in, in your own work. And if you do, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, please do let me know. So I believe that's 
it for, for, for this uh, part of the session. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, th this is always a lot of fun to do. I really love this topic. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to get to talk about it. Um, so I believe we've got a bit of time for, for, for questions. So if anybody wants to uh, jump in, this is the moment. Thanks a lot, Jovan. Yes, please, everyone who has a question, please put them in the chat box. we we'll give you a bit of time to write them. In the meantime, I would like to kick it off. Jovan, uh, I think we all saw in recent times a lot of Corona um, graphics and charts about cases or about vaccination. And I think they all missed your presentation in a way. How would you or which tips would you give them if they do those kinds of things? So one of the things that I, um, you know, I, I do think potentially, and I think this was discussed a lot in the um, data visualization community, was one of those Johns Hopkins um, dashboards. And I, you know, I, and I think that's a functional visualization, but there's also an element of, of dashboards potentially not really being suited for, for, for this type of audience. You know, so this is something that everybody is interested in. So potentially thinking about actually what are the formats of communicating this data? I love, um, for example, the FT has done a fantastic open access visualizations on uh, coronavirus cases and and displaying those in a really simple but meaningful way and i would say that in many ways the 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 aesthetic problems that they're dealing with are the top three so aptness efficiency and clarity i think uh, most advanced yet acceptable uh, has a place within that but in some of those cases that we've we've seen really the problem comes at the beginning of that kind of flow of of or, or approaching the process. Um, and I think potentially looking, especially around efficiency. So I've, I've seen some charts which, which kind of have this tone, which, which tries to be very, very serious about this information because it is serious information, but at the same time um, kind of loses some of that clarity uh, or loses some of the efficiency in terms of how it communicates the data. Thanks. Uh, Enrico has a question. What about tools to create graphs? Any suggestions? Ha, uh, I, so I'm really not, I use a lot of tools, uh, and I, I, I really feel that tools have a, a, a place, but I, I, in many ways, I think a lot of these conversations we're having is precisely because of what tools tend to give us. And to frame this, I often think about Excel and Excel has a lot of these default charts and they're not necessarily bad, but I think a lot of these charts are designed with a slightly different intention in mind, which, and I, I think part of that intention is potentially selling Excel. And I think, you know, other tools out there like Tableau or, or other elements also have that element of let's show what we can do with these with uh, with our computers and and make these charts really exciting and go through the roof and add 3d and and show it in different ways but in many ways actually what we want to you know what how i want to go back to in terms of process is thinking really about the effect of connecting data to to people's brains and the tool at the end of the day really needs to be invisible and i use anything from excel uh, which I've used a lot of for, for this presentation. So all of the charts I've made have been in Excel here to using um, R, which is a fantastic programming language where, where you can really define each aspect of the chart exactly the way you want. So I, I, I would say really process first and then make whatever tool you choose fit around that. Raw graphs is another example. I, I, I'm, I've seen some of the other presentations that have been mentioned here and, and it's a great tool but then people will use that to go further into Illustrator. So I think it really depends uh, where you want to get to. But for the most part, I think this structure first and you make the tools get there, you know, whatever tool you're using. Another question from Carlos, um, how to use data visualization to change people's behaviors and attitudes? So, I, you know, this is a really interesting 
question from the point of view that I think there are two functions of data visualization. One of those is awareness, um, and and that's that's what we would call um, exploratory visualization. So things where where there's no real kind of points to it. It is just again presenting facts um, very openly. And then on the other side, we have visualization, which is used for persuasion, uh, which is what we saw, for example, in um, uh, Florence Nightingale's Rose Diagram or uh, Mona Chalabi. And the idea is that you you try to convince or show a certain message. And I think, especially in terms of trying to change people's perceptions, I think that's where the role aesthetic of aesthetics um, kind of really comes through. And I really like the, the Chalabi example, because I think this is the idea of, never mind the conventions, we're going to turn this around, we're going to open it up, we're going to make it more accessible in a way. Um, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of data visualization practitioners might feel different ways about her work, but I think that's the point, which is by changing some of these aesthetic attributes, you get another angle into people's worlds, which helps them uh, see the world differently, which is, which in a way is, is kind of part of what we want to do. Uh, Christina is asking, what about truthfulness of the data visualizations which are shown? I am so happy that you've asked me that because this is obviously one of one of the big questions. So I probably start from the position of that by definition, every chart that is representing data has nothing to do with the truth. So the chart in and of itself is not truth. The what we're trying to do is convey truth, which doesn't sit in the chart, it sits in what's happening in the real world. And this is kind of why I was talking about that uh, model of, of our connection to, to reality and facts and how they're gathered into data. Um, now, the challenge we have is that each design decision adds a layer of interpretation and understanding of the truth. But I would also argue that not engaging with a design process is also a way of influencing the truth. So, and, and I am talking about data visualization, which I think by definition has to be true to the true to the real world. It has to be honest. It has to communicate um, information that is about the world and does it so truthfully. Um, but the idea is that design all, well, whether you are engaged actively in design or just use default, let's say, Excel graph, um, there you've handed over the truth to Excel uh, rather than engaging with the truth with yourself or you're using a default chart type from a library. Um, again, you're, you're giving that library uh, in, uh, for that chart type um, a sense of how it's communicated and that influences the truth rather than you as a person who's deciding about how to communicate it. And I think that's where the difference comes in. Uh, thanks. Nuno wants to know, what is your opinion on grid lines in charts? Either on trend lines. Grid lines in charts. Oh, grid lines in charts. So, um, so from, let's say, a tough tip point of view, um, there would be something, so, so in terms of this data visualization minimalism, there would be something that could be considered excessive in charts. And, and I think that's, that's one, you know, if you went pure minimalist, you wouldn't include grid lines. But I would argue that, that you can use them. Don't forget that grid lines are a legacy from when data visualization was used to print it in books. So we're talking before magazines. So this was a summary of the data. To interpret it, you would have to follow the grid line probably with your finger to understand exactly what the, the number value is um, from, uh, from, from looking at the axis. Now, think about how much technology has changed and how we, how we don't necessarily look at, uh, you know, the purpose of those old charts and books was about communicating the data. And this was the only way of storing the data. Now we have a lot more options in terms of working around that. So the grid lines can really fade into the background. I personally tend to do a lot of this very, very subtle, almost invisible 
you know, only 5% uh, visibility, transparency type of thing with grid lines, if I need them. Um, there's probably an, ang uh, an argument towards using potentially a baseline for a certain type of chart. But um, for example, Lisa Charlotte Ross, uh, who writes a lot on data visualization best practice, might uh, will probably have something on that as well. So uh, a lot of questions are maybe not for you, but more for the colleagues uh, from us. So uh, which tools to use? I would recommend you to check for easy web tools, where are a lot of tools and Digit is offering more and more tools. And also in the community of practice on Connected, you can find lots of tools which are available to us. So you're not only limited to Excel. Um, Beatrice is asking which of the four principles you mentioned is the most important one. So, so that's a really tough question to answer. Um, I think that whenever you're making a chart, all of those principles happen at the same time, whether you want it or not. Um, and this is, again, going back to this idea of defaults coming from software. Uh, I've, I've said horrible things about Excel. I think Excel is actually a great tool for data visualization. You just have to spend a lot of time in the formatting menu. Um, so the idea is that all of these principles kind of come together in, in, in different ways. Um, I think to answer that question, it really depends on who your audience is. Because, um, you know, if you're trying to get somebody excited, you might need to go more into the area around most advanced yet acceptable. If you're trying to communicate something very, very clearly, you're going to be using um, efficiency or, or um, minimalism in a way to, to display your visualization where the emphasis is on the data. So it's a it depends type of answer, which we get a lot of in data visualization. Thanks. Glenn would like to know how you deal with multilingual or multicultural readers. That is a very, very interesting question. Um, I'm kind of going to answer it that that goes back a little bit to the concept of aptness. So what is appropriate for the audience and what is the context that they'll be seeing it in? Um, and we can talk about something as basic as color choices. Um, and color, color has different meaning in different cultures, in different languages. So it is really going back to understanding the audience and understanding the culture, making sure that it is appropriate. Working with, I'm trying to think of examples of, of uh, multilingual visualizations, specifically in terms of the aesthetics of the design, but I, I quite honestly can't think of a, a good example. That's, that, that would be something I really want to look into. Um, and it leads uh, for the, to the next question and maybe the last one from Piotr. Do you recognize any organizations or companies at being good and communicating through DataViz? Um, a lot. Um, I feel that, that, that we are actually in, in a very exciting time uh, for data visualization. Um, and I believe it's becoming more prominent. So we do see bad things coming out as well. But the work that um, the Financial Times uh, data visualization team does is fantastic. I've seen Bloomberg use a very, very unusual data visualization language for, for their audience, for what is a business audience. They've gone very, very unusual with, with how they communicate information. Um, but then there's, there's individual practitioners who I think are absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm trying to think back to, you know, um, uh, I've mentioned Mona Chalabi. You had Federica Fragapane talking uh, for one of these sessions recently, and her approach to aesthetics is phenomenal. It's, it's, it's really something that, that draws you in and, and kind of navigates you around this uh, visualization. So um, thank you very much, Jovan. And thank you all for joining us. And I hope we see each other again in two weeks where we will have two colleagues from uh, Harvard University who will talk about communicating complex economic topics to policymakers. And I would like to close the session with a nice quote here in the chat from Ralph. A fool with a tool is still a fool. <laughs>